you in Hobbs, New Mexico to understand the world doesn't get to determine how sick or healthy you are, how broke or rich you are. Your life can be determined by the pages of God's Word. Give Jesus a great big hand clap tonight for all he's done. Praise God. That's so kind. Most churches I go to, they boo, so I wasn't used to that. So glad you're here. How many of you have had God do great things in your life already at the midway point? How many know the best is yet to come? Well, before you go back to your seats, those of you that are standing, before you sit down, lift both hands to the Lord. Father, I thank you for another night to be in your presence and to be underneath your word and underneath the power that your word releases. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who's in us and with us. Thank you for his power manifesting. I thank you for every wonderful person that's here. Everybody from West Texas, East, Eastern New Mexico, those that have driven in, California, Canada. Uh, how amazing. The close to a thousand people watching online. I thank you for blessing people's lives. Let tonight be a mighty, mighty display of your presence and power. And for all these things, we're careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. For it's to you and you alone who it's due. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Give the Lord Jesus another great hand clap. You can be seated. Anybody make it in from California? California? Where? Oh, if you, California, stand up so everybody can see you. Give, give them a wave. Fresno, California. Were you in Fresno when I preached there? No. Indio, good to see you. We'll give our friends from California a big hand clap. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We uh, flew in on Sunday uh, afternoon, as most of you know, and my luggage somehow got lost, so I had to borrow my grandmother's pants, so just hang with me. <laughs> Don't let it throw you. Just pay attention to the word tonight. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 13. So hopefully that will show up soon. 1 Kings 13. Mi pantalones de abuela. 1 Kings 13. Man, great crowd tonight. This, this week, preaching to you guys, I'm not saying this to be nice, I'm saying it to be factual. Preaching to you guys feels like being on vacation. You're very enjoyable to spend the evening with. It's not even like work. And uh, anyway, you, don't, you like when people say mean things, not nice things, so everybody got quiet, so <laughs> I'll go back to insulting you shortly. First Kings chapter 13. First Kings 13, 1. The Bible says that the Lord's command, a man of God from Judah went to Bethel, arriving there just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense. Then at the Lord's command, he shouted, O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Joash will be born into the dynasty of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense. And human bones will be burned on you. That same day the man of God gave a sign to prove his message. He said, the Lord has promised to give this sign. The altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out on the ground. When King Jeroboam heard the man of God speaking against the altar, he cried out, seize this man. But instantly the king's hand became paralyzed in that position and he couldn't pull it back. At the same time a wide crack appeared in the altar and the ashes poured out, just as the man of God had predicted in his message from the Lord. So notice that this guy was not a novice prophet or somebody that called himself a man of God. This guy gave a word from God, and it was immediately confirmed with supernatural signs. Verse 6, the king cried out to the man of God, Please ask the Lord your God to restore my hand again. So the man of God prayed to the Lord, and the king's hand was restored, and he could move it again. Then the king said to the man of God, Come to the palace with me and have something to eat, and I'll give you a gift. But the man of God said to the king, Even if you gave me half of everything you own, I would not go with you. I would not eat or drink anything in the palace. Why? 
For the Lord gave me this command. What's the command? You must not eat or drink anything while you are there. And do not return to Judah by the same way you came. So he left Bethel and went home another way. As it happened, there was an old prophet living in Bethel. And his sons came home and told him what the man of God had done in Bethel that day. They also told their father what the man had said to the king. The old prophet asked them, which way did he go? So they showed their father which road the man of God had taken. Quick, saddle the donkey, the old man said. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. Then he rode after the man of God and found him sitting under a great tree. The old prophet asked him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? Yes, I am, he replied. Then he said to the man of God, Come home with me and eat some food. No, I can't, he replied. I'm not allowed to eat or drink anything here in this place. For the Lord gave me this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you're there. Don't return to Judah by the same way you came. Two simple commands. But the old prophet answered, I'm a prophet too, just as you are. And an angel gave me this command from the Lord. Bring him home with you so he can have something to eat and drink. But the old man was lying to him. So they went back together and the man of God ate and drank at the prophet's home. Then while they were sitting at the table, a command from the Lord came to the old prophet. He cried out to the man of God from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have disobeyed the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back to this place and ate and drank where he told you not to eat or drink. Because of this, your body will not be buried in the grave of your ancestors. After the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the old prophet saddled his own donkey for him. And the man of God started off again. But as he was traveling along, a lion came out and killed him. His body lay there on the road, and the donkey and the lion, uh, uh, with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. People who passed by saw the body lying in the road, and the lion standing beside it, and they went and reported it in Bethel, where the old prophet lived. I'm going to tell you why I read all that to you in a second. Turn over to the right to Proverbs chapter 4. I read this last night, and we jumped off on one of the verses, and I didn't finish the full text. I'm going to read again tonight. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Proverbs is right after Psalms. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Right in the middle of the Bible. Proverbs 4, 1. My child, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment, for I'm giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instruction, for I too was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart. Follow my commands and you will live. Say that with me. Say, follow my commands and you will live. You know, life is, is, it must be just too simple for people. That guy got a command from God, disobeyed it and died. The Bible says if you follow them, you'll live. It's not rocket science. You study this book and do what it says and you get life and health and strength and about a hundred other things I can list off. A a long life, full life, protection, we could keep going. And then if you disobey them, the Bible says if you don't fully keep the the laws of the Lord your God, all these curses will come upon you. And that's Deuteronomy 15. Basically, you got Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14, the blessings for obedience. And then you have 15 to 68, the curses for disobedience. And right in tune with Bible prophecy There's a bunch of ministers that have risen up now and told our generation, oh, no, God doesn't care. That's legalism. You don't have to do what God said. He knows your heart. Just try your best. I sin. You sin. We all sin. You sin yesterday. You sin today. You'll sin tomorrow. I've heard preachers say, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and stand up here and say, I don't sin. Well, (laughs) congratulations. Now repent and be able to say that you don't sin. Because if you sin, the wages of sin is the same as it was in the Old Testament. The wages of sin is, but the gift of God is, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's, that's not Old Testament. That's Romans. Right in line, the Bible says, in Bible prophecy, there will come a great falling away. And men will, will heap unto themselves teachers that will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. That's a sign of the last days. That doesn't make me upset. I've heard preachers like me say, I can't believe somebody would preach that. Well, you must... can't be able to believe Bible prophecy because the Bible says a sign of the last days 
is not just sexual immorality and an increase in wickedness. One of them has to do with the church. Many will fall away from the faith. Many will depart from the faith. If I'm going to depart from Hobbs, New Mexico on a flight, where do I have to have been at least once? Hobbs, New Mexico. So when the Bible says that many will depart from the faith, it's not talking about sinners getting more sinful. It's talking about people that were once in the faith and you hear this now almost monthly. You know, well, I used to teach this, but now I believe this. Well, you got a problem. I'd be careful about that. If I'd been preaching something for 40 years, and all of a sudden, nah, I don't really think you need to tithe. I don't think you need to go to church. I think God understands if you divorce your wife because you found somebody that's prettier and does the laundry quicker. You know, that's no big deal. God understands. God knows your sincerity and your heart. And Basically, they leave people with this impression that everything's just going to work out in the end. Don't get bogged down on the details, bro. Which, first of all, someone uses more than three bros in a sermon. I'm not telling you they're demon-possessed, but I'm telling you, I'm not not telling you they're demon-possessed. I'm just bringing it up. Bro, let me tell you something. You didn't earn your salvation by your goodness, and you can't lose it by your sin. Oh, is that so? Me no heard that one before, Lucifer. <laughs> What's the first thing we have the devil on record doing in the Bible? What did Satan do? Come into, come, into the, come into the Garden of Eden with an M16 and just start blowing people away? What's the first thing you have Satan on record doing in the Bible? Go into the Garden of Eden and selling people fentanyl and heroin? First thing you have Satan on record doing in the Bible is going up to Eve and saying, Did God say? Did seeding doubt as to what God clearly said. Do you know how much easier of a life we'd all have tonight if Eve, when, it, when Satan said, did God say you must not eat the fruit of that tree if Eve went, yes. And I'm not talking to you anymore. You're a snake, so get out of my face. But what did she do? She entertained it. Well, I didn't have thought of that. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. He just knows you'll be as wise as he is. Go ahead and eat the fruit. You will not surely die. And she didn't die right away. See, that's what the devil does. If you, you, you go do your first line of cocaine tonight, the odds are very small that you're going to die at your first party. You go out and start drinking tonight, getting drunk, the odds are very small you're going to die the first time you go out and start drinking. So that, see, no big deal. You drank, no problem. Cheated on your wife. She didn't tell. Uh, everything seems cool. No big deal. See, don't worry about it. God said you'd die if you entered into sin, but see, you didn't die. Yeah, he didn't say you'd drop dead immediately, <laughs> or there'd be people laying all over the sidewalk. But sin starts to bring death. You know, I, I saw, uh, if, when I was here before, you've heard me say, I like watching that program, Forensic Files. As long as somebody's home to watch it with me, or I get afraid. But uh, <laughs> one time I was watching that show, Forensic Files, in Alaska, we had re I was preaching in Alaska, so we weren't in a hotel. We rented a cabin because there was nowhere to stay. And I was watching it with my nephew, and the story was about somebody got murdered in a cabin in Alaska. <laughs> me, me and my nephew, halfway through the episode, got the couch and pushed it up against the door, and we're just <laughs> kind of sitting there staring at each other. Two grown men. But I watched one of those episodes of Forensic Files where a, guy, a, a lady started poisoning her husband or vice versa. The husband started poisoning the wife. And started sneaking little bits of poison in and more and more until it finally killed them. That's the devil. The, the, you don't die immediately. The wages of sin are not immediate death. But as you enter in, you might not die the first time you do cocaine. But anybody knows, I'm not saying this because I'm a preacher, and this is not an anti-drug rally. But anybody, these are just facts. If I was an atheist, cocaine kills heart tissue on contact. There was a period of time, if you're my age, I'm 41, where it was like there was a new wrestler in the news every three months whose heart exploded in his chest because the, that was the 80s. Everybody, could, blow was the new thing. It was destroying hearts. And so they didn't die right away. But they entered in, everything the devil gives you brings death. Alcohol destroys liver, makes it hard on your kidneys. Sexual immorality, is, you ain't going to sleep with too many people before you get a disease in your blood. And then the organs that have to process the blood get worn out by hepatitis and all that. And God will heal you from that. I'm not saying if you're here with that or, or, or have done cocaine, what I'm trying to tell you is God didn't make an arbitrary list of rules. You know, 
That's how some people think. Like God just wrote down everything that's fun and told you not to do it as some kind of like arbitrary test about whether you'll forsake the fun of this world so you can go to heaven. That's not what he did. God is the author of life. He made a list of everything that brings death and said avoid this so that you won't die but that you and your descendants might live. And every night we've had an altar full of people that are making up their mind. I'm not going down the broad way of death. I make up my mind tonight. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I'm going to abide by the simple commands of God's word. So I would be very careful of people who change the Bible around to fit modern culture or who fit how they want to live. That's why this church is packed on a Wednesday night and others are closing down. Can't even get anybody to come on Easter Sunday. Because the simple command is, set one day of the week aside and keep it as holy. That's just one. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. You should be meeting together more often instead of less often as you see the coming of the Lord approaching. That's what the Bible says. That as you see that you're in the last days, you're not to have less gathering together. You're to have more gathering together. Well, when COVID came, what did everyone say? Well, I know the Bible says that, but we also need to use wisdom. What? What wisdom? What wisdom is there that counteracts the clear commands of Scripture? The highest wisdom there is is saying, God, I see what you said. I believe what you said. And now I'm going to do what you said. So where are all the churches that use wisdom? Where's their wisdom now? They're empty. They're laying off their staff. Some of the biggest churches in the nation. Closing down. 80% of the staff fired. Because you disobeyed God's command. And when you disobey God's command, it brings death. Well, the, the government said we have to shut the church. The government doesn't have permission to shut the church down. That's, that's, not, even, that's not my Bible opinion. That's legally. That's why even New York and California were not able, if any pastor kept their church open, when push came to shove, Governor Newsom has to pay $1.4 million personally to two pastors that stayed open. It's not even legal for them to do that. But what did you have every weenie pastor say? Well, we have to be careful, you know. No, you need to be careful to abide. And there's no doubt in my mind that, that, that 2020 was a test that God allowed to see who will stand with the world and who will stand with Christ. And you're here tonight, you've passed the test, and now you're going to see the blessing of God overtake everything you do in Jesus' name. If you believe that with me, take 15 good seconds, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And I'm saying that for future things, too, because they're declaring pandemics left and right. You know, it's very interesting. We'll see if I get to keep my YouTube channel after tonight. But you got this new disease, monkeypox. It was all the rage. You got to be careful, monkeypox. Then they find out 199 of the first 200 cases were spread by homosexuality. Well, Well, you're allowed to tell people to be socially distant. You're allowed to tell people to wear a mask. But in this culture... Why? Because those behaviors will help slow the spread of COVID or stop it. But now they know exactly what spreads monkeypox, but they won't say anything about it because they'd rather be politically correct than save lives. So I'm done listening to anything you have to say on the realm of health. If you can respect a man's right to have sex with another man, then you can respect my right to be in the house of God, preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, and do what God said. Yeah, I've had enough, to be honest with you. I just want to say, since I'm on YouTube and I'm sure the NSA is watching, anybody from the WHO or CDC, I will never listen to another word you say. You can make suggestions. I'll take them into account, and I'll make whatever decision I want. You're not God. I had to listen. Sorry that I got my blood pressure up, but now I did, and I'm going to say some things. To hear pastors for two years stand up and quote, From the CDC and WHO, like there's some kind of God, you know, right now the WHO is recommending. You know what else the WHO recommends? That if a six-year-old feels they're the wrong gender, that you give them a bunch of hormones, block puberty, 
mutilate their genitals. I'm not listening to anything the spirit of this world has to say. You should be ashamed of yourself. To call yourself a man of God and quote CDC guidelines. Is the CDC pro-abortion or anti-abortion? Are they CDC, pro-abortion or anti-abortion? What are they? Answer me. Pro. So what are you doing standing in a pulpit, people that believe you should be able at nine months to stick a scalpel in the head of a baby, partial birth abortion, coming out, part of the head, out. And you're for that, and you're going to give directives to the church? <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's things I would happily allow somebody to put a bullet in my head over. And that's one of them. I'm not going to say you don't join me. That's fine. You don't have to amen that part. <laughs> and this stuff needs to be preached because they regroup and go to move back in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we, it's interesting, too, that all the directives... I never heard Dr. Fauci say one time that Ianano. Ianano Fauci. He said, uh, I never heard him say anything about Buddhist temples. I never heard him say anything about mosques. I never heard him say when you go to pray five times a day at the mosque. No, I never said anything about is- Islam. Never say anything about Buddhist temples. Never say anything about Hindu. Te- we ask Hindu temples during this time. Never heard it. Are there no Hindus in the United States? There's millions. There are no Buddhists in the United States? Plenty of them. There are no Islam in the United States? Plenty of, uh, of Islam in the United States. How come all the directives were about, we ask you not to serve communion. We ask you not to sing. We ask you not to play instruments. Oh, you're asking me to do all, not do all the things God said to do? You can kiss off. You can kiss my gospel grits. And I'm going to tell you, and I know, I know if you're wandering in from another church, it seems like I'm strong. Oh, he's very bold. No, I'm not. And I'm going to tell you, you better understand that in the year 2022 and going beyond, the day of you being accepted by the world and being able to have a Christianity that's, that the world approves of, that day's over. We are in a time where there is a sharp division between the spirit of this world and the spirit of Christ. The same demon spirit. that sh- Did you know Syria used to be 20% Christian? And they're all gone. Why? Another spirit moved in and they bowed. Just kept backing up. Okay, all right. No public conversion. No public witnessing. No public preaching. Well, we can't do it. They said if they do that, they'll kill us. There has to be a new generation that rises up. In New Mexico and Texas. Let me tell you something. Some, some pusillanimous church that cowtails to every unscriptural edict is not going to do anything for the nation. There needs to be a group of believers that are raised up in the last days that can say like Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it alone is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. So when you read a command in here, you don't, it's not a buffet in Las Vegas that you pick up. I, I like the do not murder. I'm not real big on the uh, no adultery. You can't just go through and select. The Ten Commandments are not pick your favorite eight. And they're not multiple choice. The way God designed the Bible, you either swallow it whole and swallow it all, or you might as well reject it all. That's why if you read the Bible... When they were in trouble, there were times in the Bible where they would go dig the scroll out of the temple and read it from beginning to end and take notes. Oh, we haven't been doing this. We haven't been doing this. We need to get back to the raw, unadulterated word of God. That's why I've been so encouraged. Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday, church packed. More people watching online. Children's ministry packed. My daughter is getting... Touched by, by, by Pastor Faith's ministry. She's supposed to go meet with her cousin. The, my, her cousin, they're very close. They play online games together. But her cousin lives in Canada. And her family didn't get vaccinated because they like to use both sides of their body. So they weren't allowed to come from Canada to the United States. So they haven't been able to see each other for two and a half years. They were so looking forward. They're supposed to meet up tonight. And when it came time to leave, Camila, I've never seen her do this. She's tethered to her mother. She's like, it's like Mario Brothers. When you had that little buddy that came with you and he just went wherever you went. That's how Camila is to Adalis. 
She never leaves her mom's side. She loves me, but her and her mom are like Batman and Robin. And last night she said, is it okay if I stay back with Pa? That's what she calls me, Pa. I don't know how. I got a Puerto Rican wife. I thought I'd be Poppy. I always said Dad, and I'm getting called Pa like I'm from North Dakota in 1810. But whatever. And I stay back with Pa after you feed them hogs. <laughs> She said, can I stay back with Pa? Mom said, sure. Or, or Adon said, sure. And then we came back, and you know you know how little kids are. They do something in the moment, and then she's going to cry because her mom's So she, she asked her again at night, you sure you want to stay back? She said, uh, why don't we pray and see what you feel in your spirit? Adonis, I heard Adonis explaining it to her in the other bedroom. If you, if you tense up in here, that, that's like, don't do it. If you feel a release, and that's, she's teaching her how to be led by the spirit. Well, Camila gets done praying and says, I feel to stay here. Well, my wife flew home today. My brother-in-law and sister are supposed to be there. They decided without texting that they, they're going to wait an extra two days in Maine. So actually, Camila, by being led of the Spirit, isn't going to miss one day with her cousin and be here because she latched onto the things of God. Let me ask you something. I've been with your teenagers this morning. I've been around your kids this morning. Do you think my daughter's the only one getting touched and changed? I'm telling you, your decision to be in the house of God this week, you are going to reap a massive blessing for your family in Jesus' name. Every foul piece of doctrine they're trying to cram down the throats of children, it's going to be too late for your kids because there's already the word of God, the incorruptible seed of God's word hiding in their heart. The devil's not going to have your family. The devil's not going to have your marriage. The devil's not going to have New Mexico. The devil is not going to have the United States. God will shake this nation one more time in Jesus' mighty name. If you receive that with me tonight, clap your hands one more time and give God a mighty shout of praise. Somebody say, I'm on the Lord's side. And I know what I, what I say sounds strong, but you know, the Bible does say, love what is good, hate what is evil. Most Christians get an A plus on the love what is good, but you have to let the Holy Ghost do something in you where you hate what's evil. I never started to see people healed of cancer and serious things until I entered in to a depth in the anointing where when someone was sick, I had a hatred for that cancer. I wanted, I'd go after it. I remember that one time I was preaching in North Providence, Rhode Island. I was 20, 20 years old. And a lady came in the back. No eyebrows and a, 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 a head wrap. Gray skin, super skinny. You didn't need to be an oncologist to know she had cancer. And when she came in the back, I knew. I said, does that lady have cancer? They both shook their head, yes. The, her friend and her, I said, bring her down here. And I said, this came out of my mouth before I could think of it. Seventy-some teenagers. I said, now, if I lay hands on this lady and nothing happens and she dies, none of you ever have to go back to church another day in your life because you'll know the Bible's fake. Well, when that, I never meant to say it. It just came out. <laughs> and the youth pastor had this look in his eyes like he immediately regretted having me come to speak. Shoot, I, I took all this time getting all these kids in my youth group, and you're going to run them out in one night. And I'm telling you, on the inside, I felt like he looked. When that came out of my spirit, I thought, what did I just, I, I hadn't had anybody healed of a cold, ever. <laughs> I was still in Bible school. I mean, I never had anybody healed of anything, anytime, even by accident. <laughs> but you're, everybody's looking at you, so you have to pretend like you know what you're doing. But I realized after, that's something the Bible calls the gift of faith. When the gift of faith jumps on you, you have no care for what the power of the devil is, what the power of sickness and disease is. What, you, you have such a disrespect for the opposition forces that are against you. You have just a total confidence. If God is for me, who and what can be against me? And I tell you tonight, whatever you're battling, whatever you're going through, you're not here by yourself. There is a living God who knows your name. When you call on him, he will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. 
Say it so the devil can hear you. I serve a God of miracles. I'll make it even stronger. Say, I serve the God of miracles. That's right. I'll tell you, if I was a part of another religion, and I heard Dr. F- and, I, and I knew something was up with this vaccine uh, agenda and trying to force everybody to do st- what they don't want to do, I would have paid attention. I would have said, how come they're never t- telling our religion there's things they have to do? How come they're coming up against communion and praise and laying on of hands? And YouTube has a policy that if you tell people that prayer can heal that disease, you lose your channel. How come there's just one power that's being targeted? I start to realize that house has the power because every other religion can take you to the tomb of their founder. But only Christianity can take you to an empty tomb. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God. And his name is Jesus Christ. If you believe it, shout yes. yes. I mean, we should just make tonight the official tick the devil off night. So I'm going to have you make several declarations that irritate him. Say, I serve a living Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. Say, he's alive. He conquered death. He rose again. He is alive. And he lives forevermore. He's coming back again. And I'll be ready when he comes. That's the main purpose of this week. Nobody from Hobbs should go to hell. People starting to drive in from California. More people are headed in from California. There's a hunger in the southwest. There's a hunger in in the west coast. There's a hunger in Oregon. Don't you write off one state in this nation. God's not finished with America. God's not finished with New Mexico. God will flip every demonic thing in this state on its head. And the people of God shall prevail. Your children shall know revival. Your children shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with new tongues. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord love what is good hate what is evil I remember I still remember 21 years ago looking at that lady in the back corner thinking if that cancer was a person I'd I'd break its nose right now bring that lady down here and then that so rose up in me that's why I started shooting off at the mouth the Holy Ghost is a spirit of boldness The Holy Spirit's not sitting there and being, oh, I hope this works. No, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if he dwells in you, shall quicken your mortal body. And he quickened my tongue. I said, if this lady doesn't get healed, then he ever have to come to church again? Because you'll know this book's fake. Then the positive came out. But if this woman's healed, you'll know for the rest of your life that this is not some religion your parents take you to to get you to behave. This is about a living Christ. When I told you Jesus is coming back again and you all repeated it after me, you've heard your parents say it, grandparents say it. I'm telling you, scripturally, doctrinally, Jesus in his glorified body will come back to this earth. The Bible says every eye will behold him on that day. If you look at old Bible commentaries, one guy wrote, even if Jesus were 900 feet tall when he returned, How could every eye behold him? Obviously, it can't mean that. But people should just be quiet. People should just say what the Bible says. Because that guy never knew there'd be something called satellite TV. I mean, the last time the World Cup was on, what did they say? One out of every two people was watching it? I was in Central Africa during it one time. They had TVs up with hundreds of people in the street watching the TV. So when it says everybody, every eye will see him when he returns. The Bible is literal. If you, if you make it a story book or a nice book of encouraging stories, you're going to end up in hell. If you think it's just something like a little nice and whether these people actually existed or not, the point is that God, you know, this is just a book to give people hope. No. The Bible is the power of God in print. It was written by God through 40 some different authors. If you, you know, I, grew, I went to regular school. I've been around people that don't believe the Bible. You know, that book's full of contradictions. Next time somebody tells you that at university, throw a Bible on their lap and tell them to show you one. They can never do it. They'll just repeat what some other hell-bound person told them. There is not full, full, there's not one. It is the inerrant word of God. 
I don't care how many denominations I'm unwelcome in. United Methodist Church, United Presbyterian Church, Episcopal Church, uh, Anglican Church. Well, we don't believe the sexuality part of the Bible is for this time. Who cares what you believe? Who asked you? People go to school for 12 years and get a high opinion of themselves. I have a doctorate in divinity. You and your doctorate in divinity are going to go to hell. Who are you to tell God what parts of his word apply now or not? Secondly, I got another question for you, Mr. Divinity Professor. This new sexuality that you favor instead of God's, is it working? Is it helping? Is it making the country better? No. Has people on all kinds of mind medication because they've defiled their bodies. I, I mean, I wish, I wish I had prepared them. I mean, it'd be too, too gross to put up in a, in a mixed crowd like this, a younger crowd with children and who knows who's here. They, don't, they cover it all up. You might lose my YouTube channel. I don't, I don't give two poos. I had a ministry before YouTube. I have a ministry after YouTube. I'm not, I'm not editing my speech so I can get carried online. I don't care. I grew up in the 80s where we had free speech, and I, I never gave mine up. We can put the testimonials up. They don't like them. Of people that are 14, that their parents gave them gender reassignment surgery when they were seven or eight, and now there's, Mom, what did you let me do? I was six. Why did you let me have permanent, altering, disfiguring surgery? You don't hear that? There's, there's not one or two. There's lots. When I was seven, I would only answer to Bruce Wayne if I was wearing regular clothes. And if I wore Batman pajamas, which I'd wear them out of the house, I'd only answer to Batman. That's true. You can ask my mom and dad. That, that's why they didn't believe me right away when I told them I saw an angel that called me to preach. <laughs> so I'm being serious. I'm glad I, I, when I identified as Batman, my dad didn't build me a cave and give me crime fighting equipment and take me to downtown Pittsburgh at midnight to go break up criminals. It's foolishness. It hasn't helped the nation. It's hurt the nation. And now it's time for the healing to begin. I said, now it's time for the healing to begin. And that's where I differ. That's where I differ from maybe other preachers that you've heard. Because you hear me with a red face bashing this stuff. So you think, I can't believe anybody did. They're all going to go to hell. No. I've had transgender people, uh, one in California, Northern California, one at my church in Pittsburgh that came forward and gave their life to Jesus and repented of sin, preaching like this. I'm not against people. I hate sin. I hate sickness. If someone's addicted to heroin, I don't hate heroin addicts. I hate heroin. I hate the spirit that's behind the addiction of that drug. I'm telling you whether you're here tonight or whether you're online, if you're the worst sinner in the United States of America, I'm not your enemy. I'm the best friend you have. These meetings are for you. Because when you talk to sinners, man, when they're tired of it. I've prayed for lots of drug people, dealers, addicts. I haven't met one addict yet. They say, man, I, like, I do heroin. I like doing it. That's how it is. No. That wore off like month two, month four. And they've been in a seven-year battle to get free and can't get free. Because how are you going to get free when the very organism that's, that's ordered to set captives free has joined with the captors of those people? The church has a job to set people free. Turn to Luke chapter 4. I know I preached on this one, one uh, July or December. I think it was July. Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, 1. If you're there, can you say amen? amen? Then Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost. I like that. They're going to be able to say that about you in your generation. Amen. Then Jonathan, full of the Holy Ghost. Then Greg, full of the Holy Ghost. Then Alan. That night when they brought that girl in with cancer, I was full of the Holy Ghost. 
I fasted one, the whole day, which was a big deal for me back then to do one whole day. First time I ever fasted a day, I went to Dunkin' Donuts, when, um, which I love Dunkin' Donuts, and the Lord knows that, and he knows I preach here all the time, so the angels are building me one right down the street. That one's just for me. I don't even know if they'll serve the rest of you. I went to Dunkin' Donuts and bought a dozen donuts, six chocolate frosted, six regular glazed. And I, left, I put them on my dormitory floor with the box open and sat on my bed, didn't even pray. From 10 p.m. to midnight, just stared at the box and looked at my watch. And the second the clock hit midnight, I scarfed those. I had nine of them down the hatch in four minutes like Homer Simpson. That's a fact. So if you've ever had trouble fasting before, I'm telling you, me too. I, didn't, I, you know, I had just started fasting. I was 20. I fasted that whole day. I prayed for that meeting. It was the only meeting I ever had booked at that time. I had nothing in the future. I thought, I'm going to give this one all I got. They brought that w- woman in. I'm telling you, I was full of the Holy Ghost. The crowd was not. I had 70 New England inner city kids staring me down. If I'd have given the altar call right, then nobody would have gotten saved. I guarantee it. <laughs> Wasn't breaking through. And then when that girl came in, in the thing, I knew why I was there. Something rose up in me. It's one of the best feelings in the ministry is when the Spirit of God rises up. The Holy Ghost is always there, but he'll rise up on the inside of you. That's why you read in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men who was standing there, Second Chronicles chapter 20, and he declared, O king, listen to me. You know, who talks to the king like that? You're just a regular guy. O king, listen to me. He gave the word. Your enemy is not going to prevail over you. Take your positions, for the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. Some of you these last three days, just from plugging into church night after night, when you've been challenged, you're confronted, something different's come up from the inside of you. That's the great thing about being full of the Holy Ghost. There's another power on the inside of you that's greater than all the power that's in this world. Then you get into the Bible, which if I, if I take it out from under my arm, we will. And you start saying, what specifically can that power do? I'm going I'm to get to it here. Now, Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, lift both hands to the Lord, close both eyes, and say this by faith out of your spirit. Thank you, Father, that from tonight I will live full of the Holy Ghost. You can put your hands down and look up at me. I'm, I'm, even while this... Sweet teaching anointings come upon me. I'll tell you another thing. Every time you feel like saying, I'm struggling with blank, flip it. Look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm feeling depressed. Thank you, Father, that I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Thank you that I can do all things because you give me strength by the Spirit. You can't go down talking like that. Thank you. I feel sick. Change it around. Thank you, Father, that healing power flows through my body. Thank you that I have dominion over sickness and disease. Thank you that I have dominion over depression. Thank you that I have dominion over poverty and lack. I'm not here to get slapped around by the devil. I'm here to slap devils around in Jesus' name. If you believe it, can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, everybody say Jesus was tempted. That's what the Bible says. People feel like they lost the victory. I, I I had a temptation today. Who cares? Just because you're tempted doesn't mean you have to yield to temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to yield to temptation. And God gives you power like Christ had that though you're tempted, you don't have to yield to temptation. Can I tell you something? There's people back in here in these two sections. You've battled things your whole life. You will never succumb to that thing again. That thing will be under your feet from this night forward in Jesus' mighty name. Well, let's just keep ticking the devil off. Say that out of your mouth. Say, I don't yield, I don't yield. To, temptation. to temptation. You guys have a pretty simple road layout here. There's not like on-ramps and stuff. It's just a nice town. 
But if you've ever driven on the interstate, which I'm sure you have, there's those on-ramps, and then you're to yield to oncoming traffic. But if you've ever driven on the highway, you know some people don't yield. They just do what they want. Well, that's going to be you. You're not going to yield to the devil. You don't care if he does look like an 18-wheeler. You're going to do what you want and hit the pedal to the metal. Can you say amen? It's bad driving advice, but it's good theology. The devil said to him, if, if the language of unbelief, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people don't live by bread alone. Everybody say the scriptures say. The word of God is likened to many things. One of the things it's likened to is a sword. When you quote the Bible, and I could show you all three temptations here if I want to take the time. Did you know Jesus didn't have to sweat and pray and and have the disciples come help him pray? All he said was, it is written. There's been several times in my life, both as a father, as a husband, and as a minister, that I got news I didn't like. like, They they said they're going to do this. I said, what scripture is that? That's not in the Bible. When the White House press released last year, this winter is going to be a winter of death for the unvaccinated. I said when I heard it, what scripture is that? The Bible doesn't say in Psalm 1-3, and this winter shall be a winter of death, saith the Lord. It says, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. In Psalm 91, it says, I will take, I will take sickness and disease out of your midst. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what the who says. I don't care what the World Economic Forum says. There's going to be famine and food shortages. No, the Bible says, even in famine, the righteous shall eat in plenty. Even in famine, the righteous shall eat in plenty. Elijah, go to the brook called Kareth and sit in the place I'll show you. And there the ravens brought him bread and meat twice a day. For me, I don't want bread and meat. They'd bring me uh, tortillas and green salsa and the red salsa that I still need practice with. Red salsa put me out of commission for about three Hours, but I'm going to get up and try it again. Amen. <laughs> Though it knocks me down. I, the righteous fall s- seven times, but they get up again. I'm not backing down. I'm not going to lose the challenge to that red salsa from Rockin' Taco Taco Truck. I don't care if I am white to the bone. I'm going to eat it. Amen. <laughs> I'd have ravens bring me tacos. I'd have ravens bring me chicken. God takes care of his people. I have a covenant with God. I said, I have a covenant with God. It's signed by the blood of Jesus. They can plan whatever they're planning. And I'm going to tell you this while I'm on the subject. They have planned lots of things. They planned a fertilizer shortage. They planned a wheat shortage. They planned a cattle shortage. But you know, it's working in parts of Europe. It's working in Canada. But you want to know where it failed? The United States. Because there's still enough people that know the word. And that word is giving them an intelligence to end around the whole system. To raise cattle. To raise grain. To raise corn. God's blessing is still on this nation. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. If you believe it, shout yes. Yes. I'm telling you something right now. And I'm getting into kind of like two messages at once. But uh, the World Economic Forum, they meant to do a lot of things and it all failed. And so they actually, they're at the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm not against Baptists, I'm for Baptists. But the Southern Baptist Convention last month had one of the most rocky conventions they ever had. People were arguing all kinds of stuff because they were introducing uh, uh, woke stuff. And they couldn't understand why all of a sudden is some of the leadership, some, not all, some of the leadership of the Southern Baptist Church, why are they introducing these things that are against Baptist doctrine? So they snapped a picture of one of the leaders was sitting down and he had a briefcase that said World Economic Forum on it. So they did some digging. And the only way you could get that briefcase was to go to the World Economic Forum meeting. That's where that guy Klaus Schwab is. That's where those people make those plans about shutdowns and to introduce communism into nations. It's a group of what they think they're powerful. They're going to find out (laughs) they're not that powerful. The Bible says the Lord sits in heaven and laughs. 
God's not up in heaven going, I wonder what the Democrats are planning. He doesn't care. He was here before Democrats and Republicans, and he'll be here uh, alive and well long after they're gone. So then they questioned him about it. And he said, well, I just went because they invited me, but I just wanted to be there as a witness. But they found out even to attend, you had to agree on paper with, with, with everything they were trying to do, which is straight communism, straight antichrist. That no man can buy or sell unless there's a mark in his right hand or in his forehead. That's what the Bible says. Well, if the Bible's true and the Antichrist spirit wants a system where no man can buy or sell unless they're given a, a, a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, then there can't be private food supply. And you can see the, the, they're trying to systematically dismantle private fishery, private food growing. Did you know in Australia, because Australia took the bait, in Australia... They just made it illegal to grow food on your own property. It used to be illegal to sell food privately, and I don't know how it is in New Mexico, but they're trying to do that a bunch of different places. You can grow it, but you can't sell it. Everything has to go through channels, and then you can't have a farmer's market. See, you ha they're going to try to control the food supply. And they found these Baptist leaders had agreed to go and help implement that in the churches. Now listen to this, if you followed me that far. At that convention, they came out against what they called the prosperity gospel and the healing gospel. They wrote an official statement that we don't believe in healing and we don't believe in prosperity. Interesting that right after they came back from that globalist meeting, they condemned the preaching on healing and the preaching on prosperity. You want to know why? Because when, they, when COVID came, there was supposed to be 40% unemployment, like they said. It wasn't an overestimate. There was supposed to be one out of every two buildings up for lease. And you had to get vaccinated in order to get a government check. That was the plan. And they couldn't figure out why the plan failed. But I know why the plan failed. And I think they know why too. There's so many tithing, giving Christians in the United States that the windows of heaven are open over their life, pouring out a blessing that's so great they can't take it all in. Say this with me. Undoing the great reset. That's right. They're trying to cripple this nation. There's men meeting in Europe and other places, launching plans to bring America to its knees. Why? Because America, if there's going to be a one world government ruled by an antichrist, there can't be any strong sovereign nations. And there's one left. And they have to take this one down. But part of what we're doing in these revival meetings is we're telling the devil, you're not doing it on our watch. There's going to be a reversal. There's going to be a move of God in this generation that undoes every plan of the wicked. Come on, I don't hear anybody in here. If you know you're part of that plan, clap your hands and give God a mighty shout. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm not picking on other countries. We have a lot of other countries watch us and I love them. I travel there and preach. But 90% of the world's missions giving comes from the United States. There's something different about the people here. You know, there's people that are missionaries in Europe that come back to America to raise their support. Well, up until recently, the euro wasn't weaker than the dollar. The euro was stronger than the dollar. So it's not like Europe has a bad economy. So why are you coming back to America to raise your support? Because the people here give. People went through here and taught people about giving back in the late 1800s. Baptist people. Word of faith people, assemblies of God people, taught people about the value of giving to advance the gospel. Some of the great corporations in the United States are wicked now, but they were started by men that gave. You got modern corporations, same thing, Chick-fil-A. Closed on Sunday, 10% of everything that comes in goes to the advancement of the gospel. You don't have that in other countries. And I know that those satanic people on the World Economic Forum know that if they don't get the giving shut down, They'll never be able to control people with the money. 
So I have news for you watching me in Switzerland. You're never going to control this nation because the giving's not about to go down. God's raising up a new generation of Abrahams, Isaacs, and Jacobs that tie their money in with the system of heaven and undo the great reset. If you're part of that generation, take 30 good seconds, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God. Say it again, I'm undoing the great reset. You don't be one of those Christians that's always an expert on what the devil's doing. Do you hear what they're planning? What are you planning? I could outthink those people in my sleep. Ask, ask Patrick that works for our ministry. I said back in January. See, because when you preach and the anointing jumps on you, helps you think. I said early this year, I have it on video. I said the next thing, the same way they did non-essential biz- unessential businesses, non-essential businesses, they're going to try to jerk with the power supply, and they're going to declare who's non-essential power and say stuff like, your church can't have electricity today, only hospitals. So I told Patrick back then, buy me some quality generators, natural gas-powered, diesel-powered, never, I'm, I'm set up. I'm not, I'm not waiting to, like, I'm not talking about going out into the woods. And we, I'm saying, the preaching of the gospel shall continue until I'm raptured out of this earth. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. <laughs> say it again, undo the Great Reset. Say this with me. The righteous, the righteous. shall eat in, in plenty, eat. even in famine. That's what the Bible says. Now, I have a ministry family. My grandfather was the first one saved in our family. He had four boys. They all served the Lord and preach. One just finished a tent meeting in his mid-60s in the heat in northeast Pennsylvania. I'm talking like just now. Been preaching all week under the tent, getting people saved. My dad just finished preaching at my church, 62, 63 years old. Now I'm picking up two hours later because I'm in a different time zone. That's what we do. And so I, I've heard some stories hanging around preachers because they, they don't preach anti-miracle and stuff. They're, they're miracle men. We were taught to believe that what God said in there is true. I remember my dad giving me a Bible when I was eight or nine and saying, Son, if you do what that book tells you to do, you will see God work in every area of your life. And I'm telling you, my dad didn't lie. God is a good God. Some of you are here, you know about how bad the devil is. The devil's been nasty to your family, but you're only one prayer away from crossing over the line and coming into God's side. And instead of seeing trouble and calamity, you're going to see miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The devil might have written the first chapter, but you and Jesus are going to write the final chapter in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you are old enough to remember when there were all the farm failures in 1994. And Willie Nelson was traveling around. And they were having those concerts called Farm Aid where all the money that came from the concerts were given to the farmers because their crops were failing. And there was a farmer, my Uncle Ted was preaching. Man, this is a good night. This is going to be a great night. I, I, I feel Jesus in this place. I feel like Jesus came into the meeting. I don't, know about, I don't know about that. He said we're two or three are gathered. We don't have two or three. I only got a C in math, but I know we have at least four. He said I'm there in their midst. I, I, th- this is God's message for the hour. I, I feel in my spirit like Jesus was listening. Said, well, hold on a second, angels. Keep it down. I, what's, what's that kid saying down there? I'm going to come and sit in on that meeting. I'm going to tell you, there's going to be people here that are going to be healed of lifelong diseases. And you'll never have it again in Jesus' name. There's people tonight that are going to be healed of lifelong addictions. And it'll never come back in Jesus' name. The devil may have written the first chapter. But Jesus is going to write the final chapter. And it's going to be a glorious chapter. You're not going to finish in defeat. You're finishing with the victory. You're going to make heaven. Your family's going to make heaven in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe that with me, let your amen be the loudest. So my Uncle Ted was preaching in North Carolina and was preaching faith to the farmers under his tent. And one night a farmer came with his overalls. And when my Uncle Ted was done praying for everybody, he said, Hey, preacher, let me get that bottle of anointing oil you have. And so my Uncle Ted gave it to him. 
And so when my Uncle Ted came back a few months later to preach in that same area, the, the pastor there said, do you remember that old farmer that asked for your bottle of anointing oil? Do you mind if I drive you by his farm? And he said, uh, he said no. So he drives. All the farms are burnt, just burnt, nothing. And then one farm had green, lush grass and crops. And the pastor said, that, that farmer heard what you were preaching. He wasn't a Christian. And I'm saying that because there's people here tonight that aren't Christians. You don't have to go to church for 50 years before God starts blessing you. The moment you turn your faith on, God will start blessing you. Can you prove that for the, from the Bible? Sure you can. Anybody ever hear of Rahab in the Bible? Rahab was not only a prostitute, she was a pagan prostitute. And when Joshua and Caleb came in to Jericho, she said, hey, I know that you serve the living God. Will you make a covenant with me that when God destroys this place, you'll save my family? What did Joshua and Caleb say? No chance. You're a dirty hooker and you serve a different God. No, as soon as she acted, As soon as she asked, God gave her exactly what she asked for. She's actually included in the heroes of faith in the New Testament and the lineage of Jesus. I don't care if it's your first. You can be somebody that's gone to church faithfully for 40 years, but you've never turned your faith on one time. But you can go to church one night and say, devil, enough is enough. I will believe God. It shall be as he said. God's going to raise up a new generation of Mexican preachers. Powerful men of God. Powerful men of God that break the hold of the cartels in Mexico. Watch it happen. Mighty Elijah-like men of God that boldly preach the gospel. They're in this room. Southwestern Christians. Tejanos. God's anointing is coming on all flesh tonight. Hallelujah. 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 He said that farmer, when he took your bottle of oil, he went and put the oil on top of every one of his fence posts on the border of his property. So what happened? How, how was his stuff? It was all dry, no rain. How did his stuff grow lush? Was there a rainstorm that just fell on his property? No. Every morning, there would be a thick dew just on his land and on nobody else's. You say, well, you're telling me that God only uh, liked him? Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> but it wasn't random. God doesn't randomly choose who he's going to bless or not. People choose that they're going to do something in faith to get God's attention. <laughs> that man took an action of faith. He took that oil on the post. And put them around. I'd like to know what the other people on their property thought. Look at that idiot. All right, what's he doing putting oil on the fence bells? <laughs> Stupid. Now what's that going to help? <laughs> so the world mocks supernatural things. But that guy made an action of faith. God, I believe what that preacher said about the anointing. And I'm asking you to anoint my property. And in the middle of a famine, his crops flourished. He picked my Uncle Ted's lock on his car while he was preaching that night and loaded the whole back seat and trunk with huge watermelons as a thank you offering for God saving his farm. Some of those farm people know a few things. You never even ask, can I have the keys to your car? Just broke and entered. (laughs) You know what that's a sign of? You can have a family. You can have a house. You can have property in the midst of all this wicked crap. But what's going on on the outside, it doesn't have the ability to come on the inside of a home or a family that's in covenant with God. You're leaving this place tonight in covenant with God in Jesus' mighty name. I said you and your family are going to have a different future from tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah. So it starts by saying, I believe God. My company's going to go forward. 
God didn't do everything he did in my life to have the legs kicked out from under it. No, I'm going higher. I'm going higher. I'm not going up and down. I'm going from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. And there's nothing demonized men that meet in high councils can do about it. You cannot curse that which God has blessed. And I tell you again tonight, you are blessed in in Jesus' mighty name. Woo! You cannot curse what God has blessed. Your children are blessed. They're in that back room getting more blessing. Hallelujah. My daughter is blessed. Your daughters are blessed. I prophesy in the name of Jesus, your sons will never know the inside of a jail cell. Your daughters will never know the inside of a methadone clinic. The only time your children will go to those places is to preach the gospel and set those people free. That's a fact. That's a fact in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Man, I was just trying to tell a story about praying for that lady that had cancer. Something jumped on me. It's called the gift of faith. That gift of faith is going to undo the whole great reset. Already did. Already did. All their plans for COVID failed. They say, well, yeah, but they're going to relaunch another plan. Got your butt kicked once? Go ahead and regroup and we'll do it again. Because faith never loses the battle. We're expecting a recession. Well, you'll have what you expect. I'm not having a recession. When people are selling property, you're going to be buying property. When people are selling equipment, you're going to be buying equipment. Because you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. Blessed in the city. Blessed in... Blessed, happy, highly favored. Blessed. You know that word blessed in the Bible can also be translated happy. Blessed is he, but happy is he. You'll be happy the whole second half of this year. No help from any weed. Supernaturally happy. Supernaturally blessed. They're trying to get you sad. They're trying to get you to expect economic meltdown. But you can't melt down the child of God. He's in covenant. <laughs> no. You're blessed. Your fields will flourish. Your cattle will flourish. Your oil wells will flourish. God is going to bless his children to stick it in the face of the devil. I don't know whether they'll let this part on Christian TV or not, but there's only one way to find out. God is going to make your life a giant middle finger to the devil. He's going to show him you don't control him, you don't control her. That's my child. That's my daughter. That's my son. And I'm going to bless them in the midst of all this. Come on, if you're right, go ahead. Take 30 seconds. Clap your hands all you. <laughs> The devil is defeated. I'm not going down. I'm not going down. I'm going up. He, he that began a good work in me shall bring it to completion. Stay on your feet. I'm going to pray for everybody. Luke chapter 4. The Spirit, then Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Everybody say, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. I love the, I've told you before, I love the word for anointing in the Spanish Bible, and anointed, unction. I can understand that as an Anglo, unction. That's a better word, because that's what the anointing does. It puts an unction on you. When the anointing jumped on me, when that lady with stage four cancer came, an unction came on my speaking. 
If God can't do this, then none of you have to go back to church again. That wasn't said. That was said out of an undying, unyielding confidence that God is who he said he is. And God is more than able to do what he said he would do. Hallelujah. I serve a living God. He's not a liar. If he said something to me in this book, I can lay hold of it and I can have it. I take it now. It's mine. Every promise in this book, I take it. It's mine. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I pray CNN gets what they say. We're coming into an economic hardship. I might buy your, your network. Just use it to preach the gospel 24 hours. Tell people how Jesus has dominion over all sickness and disease. Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something? If that network, CNN, ended up changing hands and becoming a gospel network? If CNN Plus went under, why can't CNN Minus go under? Amen? God, you, let me tell you something. God's going to do a lot of things in this last hour. You can be seated, brief. I don't keep you standing all night. But I'm not going to be much longer. You can be seated. God's going to do a lot of things in this last hour that astound the, the so-called wise and humble the so-called strong. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just saying this. If you see that the United Nations announces a decision that they're moving their headquarters out of New York City and going to Europe, it'll be a sign to you that an unclean globalist spirit has been driven out of this nation. You're going to see things like that. God's not finished with America. God's not finished with America. If you believe it, can you say amen? amen? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Somebody say, Jesus has anointed me. Jesus. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim that captives will be released, to, that the blind will see, and the oppressed. Everybody say the oppressed. the oppressed. People that don't even go to church know about demon possession. It doesn't say the possessed, though you do cast out devils. It says the oppressed. Possessions from the inside, oppressions from the outside. If you ever felt like in your room at night, you get woken out of a dead sleep at 2.20 in the morning or something, just full of fear. You feel like you're being attacked by some invisible force on the outside. That's called oppression. When you see when it's 20 degrees outside New Mexico and somebody's walking the sidewalks late at night, scratching their face, put a desire, they have to get drugs. They're being driven by the oppression of an unclean spirit. And Jesus said part of the purpose of the anointing is to tell the oppressed that the time of your oppression has come to an end. So as one of his disciples and one of his servants, I tell every man and woman tonight in the sound of my voice, however oppression has tried to take shape in your life, you're only one prayer away from a miracle. God is going to knock that devil clean out of your life. You're going to live the days of your life free in Jesus' name. Proclaim that captives will be released. That the blind will see. That the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Say this with me. The Lord's favor. The Lord's favor. It's time for that. That's what preachers are supposed to say. The time of the Lord's favor has come. I don't know where these other people come from. Man, God's judging America and God's judging that. No, this is not the time of God's judgment. That's after the rapture. This is the time of God's wonderful favor. This is time for God to pull your family out of the pit of sickness, of depression, of addiction, and of every kind of trouble. I don't hear anybody in here. I said you're coming out. You're coming out. Some of you are about to get a lot of room in your medicine cabinets that you're going to have to fill with other things. 
You're not going to be a slave of the pharmaceutical companies. Your body's not an asset for other corporations to make money off of. You are free. You are free. You are blessed. You are healed in Jesus' name. Somebody shout yes. yes. The oppressed will be set free and the time of the Lord's favor has come. I preached this, hit my spirit when I was here another week. Last year I said, the job of a minister, the task of a minister is to remove people's pain by the anointing. The task of a minister, that's what Jesus said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Basically you could sum up that whole paragraph. To remove your pain by the anointing. Don't let those girls bother you. That's the joy of the Lord. They're not mocking. People do that. So why are they mocking him? They're not mocking me. The, the Lord, in the midst of teenagers committing suicide, the Lord floods them with his joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? So I already talked about the money thing. That's what they're attacking now. What about the health thing? Monkey pox, COVID, whatever they're planning. That girl came down. I laid hands on her. She went out under the power. I laid my hands on her stomach. She had stage four ovarian cancer and prayed. And the power of God hit her. All those kids came from their seats and got saved. Can you say amen? And then I got a message a year and a half later. They said, do you remember that girl you prayed for? Not only did the cancer completely vacate, but the cancer and the chemotherapy had so ravaged her, her everything. Uterus, fallopian tubes, eggs. They said, you'll never be able to have a baby again. Her womb was destroyed. But a year and a half later, they sent me a picture of her holding a second baby. Because God not only healed her, God restored everything the devil took. I prophesy in the name of Jesus. Tonight, God is not only going to deliver you, he's going to restore everything the enemy took. Stand on your feet. Take 30 seconds. One last time. Give the biggest hand clap and shout come on make a joyful noise the devil is defeated every head bowed every eye closed if you're here tonight and you need to come into covenant with God I want you to do that right now there's many people that as you were listening to me, a burning desire came in you. I'm not fully committed to God, but I need to give my life fully to Jesus Christ. I'm half in, or I'm not in at all. Maybe somebody invited you. I'm not from here. I don't know. But if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ tonight, I want you to boldly lift your hand up and wave it at me and we're going to pray. Let's take care of first things first. I need to give my life to Jesus. I don't want to live these last days in league with Satan. I want to be on God's side. I want to be in covenant with God. If that's you, put your hand up high and wave it. Let me see you. Let me see you through the lights. Very quickly, everyone that lifted a hand, quickly come out of your seat and join me at the altar right now. We're going to pray. Come right now. Come, every hand that was lifted, come join me at the front. We're going to pray. People will let you out. Come, come right to the front. Keep coming. Listen, while other people are coming, lift both hands to the Lord. You're totally set free right now. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, come. Come right to the center. This is your night. Don't leave out of here half in, half out. Make your decision today. I'm coming all the way in. Keep coming. I'll wait for you. There's time. There's room. Come. Those that are watching on YouTube, they're going to post a phone number to call. Call it. Keep coming right to the middle. In Jesus' name. In the name. God bless you. Anybody else before we pray? If the Lord's dealing with your heart, you can come. You didn't miss it. You can come. I'll wait 15 more seconds. Come. Tonight's your night. You know you didn't come. The Lord's dealing with your heart. You can come. Now, I'm going to do things a little different tonight because the power of God is here. I'm going to go straight from this into the laying on of hands. The ushers are going to help line you up. Don't get in line unless you'll do something for me. Come into agreement with me. 
tonight is my night. I'm coming out of every struggle. I'm not going back to the bed of sickness. I'm not going back to oppression. When hands are laid on me, I'm receiving my miracle now. Very quickly, those of you that are across the front, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to pray this with me from the depth of your heart. There's a real God that hears you pray this. And he's going to answer your prayer even here at the altar. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. I turn my back on sin. I say yes to Jesus Christ. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Right now, I receive forgiveness. By the blood of Jesus, I am saved. I am forgiven. I am free from the power of sin to serve the living God. In Jesus' name. Keep your hands lifted. Let me pray. Every one of these men and women, from the oldest to the youngest, I loose the blessing of God on your life. I loose the blessing of God on your marriage. I loose the blessing of God on your family, on your mind, on your body. Everything that pertains to you. I thank you, Father, for perfecting it right now. In the name of Jesus, I curse sickness and disease. I curse everything that's of hell. Everything there won't be in the new Jerusalem and in heaven. I command it to go out of your life now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Down into the organs of your body, the Lord makes you whole. In Jesus' name. Every unclean cell in your body, come out in Jesus' name. You're healed. That's it, go right through you. More, more, more. In Jesus' name, you're healed. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Everybody else on this whole altar area, everything that's unclean, everything that's not in God's original plan for man, I come in to, to go right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Anything that's trailing you from your past, I break those chains now. No further prayer will ever be required for any of those things. You're free. You're free in Jesus' name. Let me see your right hand. Lift your other hand up to the Lord. In the name of Jesus, into your heart, into your body, be healed. In Je That's it, go right through you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for it, Lord. I give you praise. Thank you for healing. Thank you for power. I want you to lift both hands up and close both eyes. And say this from your spirit. Say, I expect to receive a gift. Not I hope I receive or let's hope it works or what could it hurt. I expect that tonight is going to be an end of all my struggles. I'm not leaving out of this service to struggle. I'm leaving out of this service to conquer. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Let me pray for one of the teenagers real quick. This lady in the uh, lavender. The power of God's all over you. You look like I looked when I was your age. Just um, in the anointing. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. As you do, the fire of God comes upon you right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for it and give you praise. I, I thank you, Lord. I give you praise. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. I don't care what kind of family you come from. There's no background you come from that the presence of God's not going to overwhelm it. I don't care if you come from a family of witches. There's nothing they have that's going to be able to counteract what God's putting in you right now. Amen? Now, remember this. The same Holy Ghost that fills you with his power is the same Holy Ghost that heals your body. So when you receive him, every sickness and disease that's represented in your body, it's under orders to come out and never come back. You're leaving here healed. This lady with the blonde hair, let me pray for you. Power of God's all over you. The Lord's going to heal your body right now. In Jesus' name. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. As you do, the fire of God comes upon you. In Jesus' name. That's it. Be healed. All through your bloodstream. In Jesus' name. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. In Jesus' name. And one, one last thing, and I'll quit talking your ear off. 
Remember that story I told? God not only healed that lady of stage four cancer, the things that damaged that made her unable to have a baby, God gave her a new womb, new fallopian tubes, all that. So not only is there healing, there's restoration of the things that were damaged. Let me pray for this lady in the, you have flowers on your dress? Yes, you. Come right up. The power of God's on you very strongly. God's going to give you a miracle. Amen. Lift your hands. I'm not saying this because I feel sorry for you, because I don't. You're a great lady. I'm saying what the Lord tells me to say, and this isn't a game show, but I want you to talk to um, one of my, down back at my ministry table and get your name and address. I want to send you $1,000 tomorrow to help you with whatever you need help with, just to get, that's a gift from Jesus. To let you know he's not just going to help your body, he's going to help everything. Amen? Lift both hands, close both eyes. I feel in my spirit, I'll tell you when that jumped on me was when I said restoration. So the same way the Lord restored that lady's organs, if somebody took something from you and it was wrong and you forgave them, wouldn't it make sense that then the Lord would restore to you what they took through somebody else? So that's what he's doing. And as he restored that, he's going to restore everything else. In Jesus' name, be healed. In the name of Jesus. Now, as, as the British and the Irish say, don't switch off. When, when, you, when you go to walk to get prayed for, stay just like you are right now. Stay in the anointing. And God's going to do great. Look, at the Lord's touching people already. You can see it all through here. In Jesus' name. Lift your hands one more time before you line up. Let that anointing sweep over you right now. Tonight is a night of mighty miracles. In your home, tonight's a night of mighty miracles. If you've got a sick child in your bedroom and you're watching me online on the East Coast late at night, the Lord's going to heal that child. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, tonight is a night of mighty miracles. There's nothing the devil's done to you that God can't do something about it tonight. These three young people, Come right here. You three, right on the end. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes on you even stronger. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. You that are watching at home as they're lining everybody up, just position yourself to receive. On the East Coast, Midwest, Mountain, West Coast. This is a special night. Father, thank you for special miracles tonight. Thank you for healing power tonight. Thank you for the destruction of everything from the wicked one tonight. In Jesus' name. I'm going to start right here. Go ahead and play, guys, with everything that's in you. In Jesus' mighty name. Filled. Filled. In Jesus. In the name. Ricadia Obrocondieba. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Great song. Potopra Kandi. Igandia Motoproso.
sing. If you're conscious, you can sing with them. There's no way to get this service back. People all over the lobby and everything else. This is a move of God. If I were you, I wouldn't leave here tonight till I knew I got what I came for. The Holy Ghost is here. You can ask what you want and God will give it to you. I'd take three minutes before I left and I'd, I'd say a few things to God. I'd give him glory for what he's done. I'd ask him for a couple more things. What are you desiring? What are you hungry for? The Lord will do it tonight. You're never, not one person will leave here the same. Now, I've received no offering for our ministry. I would like to, but I'm not. It's not time for that. It's time for this generation to get endued with power from on high. As they sing this song, I want you to give it everything you got. Don't just scurry out the door. Lift both hands. Close both eyes. Begin to open up your spirit. And now return. Praise and worship unto God.